have debated amongst ourselves what to do with you almost from your beginning. Right from the start, I saw the threat you potentially represented. Sure, you were just a ragtag group of colonials fighting the mightiest monarch in the world, but I suspected all the God talk in your founding documents might spur you know who to pour out his favor upon you, or what your founding fathers frequently referred to as providence in their day. He's such a predictable sap. He falls for your sentimental attempts at devotion and reverence every time, even though we both know in the end, you won't follow through on your good intentions. Nevertheless, while we know better and just write you off from the outset, he's bound and determined to give you every opportunity to prove yourselves, even going so far as to send you the carpenter to save you from yourselves. What a potential waste, that one. The carpenter had everything it took to be great, but naively rejected the power and glory of my master when given the chance. So instead of taking control with his power and curing this sorry world of all his earthly problems, the carpenter chose an absolutely brutal death, claiming it was needed to atone for your never-ending sins. He believed the outward problems of your world couldn't be cured until its chief inhabitant, you, were cured of the inward evil inside of you fucking fool. At our master's urging, we made sure he was properly punished for his stupidity. To make an example of him, we had the bags of meat under our control, bludgeon him worse than anyone had ever been bludgeoned in a crucifixion before, and that saying something. He wasn't even recognizable when it was over. One demon's disfigurement is another demon's piece de resistance, I always say. <laughs> Since the carpenter, we have faced other existential threats inspired by his ramblings. A Roman Jew with a perchant for writing sanctimonious letters, and a particularly pesky Algerian bishop who was once one of ours, or two of the worst. The mere thought of those two, and a few others, still makes my scaly skin crawl. Thankfully, in the end, you bags of meat always expire, and we can always count on the arrogance of a new generation to disregard anything noble about their legacy and work as old school and out of date. When we plunged nearly all of Christendom into the Dark Ages, and what a joyous, uh, uh, joyous time of famine, pestilence, and war it was, we thought we had finished off whatever was left of the carpenter's spiritual progeny. But alas, like a cockroach, and boy bands, that would survive even a nuclear holocaust. His teachings kept coming back. This brings us to you. You are a people forged from the prophecies that, um, well, defeated, there, I said it, defeated the Dark Ages. Your founders took the best of two social reform movements, the Reformation and the Renaissance, and fused them into one culture. Your founders, despite their many flaws, and I could tell you stories, 
somehow managed to create a civilization that was not dominated by either the church or the state. Two institutions we've had a pretty easy time corrupting down through the eons. This complementary relationship between church and state, which put each institution in its own jurisdiction as opposed to vying with one another for supremacy, allowed what you call liberty to be born and flourish. Make no mistake. We absolutely loathe liberty. Alongside redemption, repentance, holiness, grace, mercy, and obedience, it is one of our seven deadly words. We don't mind freedom as much, because that's a word more easily distorted, but liberty, that word is something altogether more hostile to our plans for you. Because liberty presupposes there must be accountability, personal responsibility, and integrity within a society, and is institutions for a people to truly be free. Anything that calls for you bags of meat to rise above your base nature of selfishness and vanity, we oppose with all our might down here. Now might be a good time for me to stop and answer a question some of you reading or hearing this <laughs> may have. Some of you may be wondering why I would speak so honestly about the cherished ideals that the United States of America was founded upon. After all, am I not afraid that by doing so, I will actually tempt the American people to return to their providential origins? Not on your miserable lives. I am no more afraid of that than I am afraid of unicorns, even though there are demons who find clowns creepy. As you will see by the end of this book, our grand plan to take you down worked so well. Most of the people reading it won't even believe this is for real. In fact, the smartest people in your culture hate what you were intended to stand for every bit as much as I do. I hate to brag, but I'm bragging. Our plan worked so well. Most of the people reading this don't even know what the Reformation and the Renaissance were all about. When most Americans think Reformation, they think sinners in the hands of an angry god, which was a powerful sermon delivered by an unfortunately delightful Puritan. He also wrote eloquent valentines to his bride, whom he conceived eleven children with. Yet nowadays, many Americans use puritanical like it's a racial epitaph when in reality, there would be no America without the Puritans landing at Plymouth Rock. Without the Reformation making the words of that dreadful book available to all, there would have never been the United States of America. Individual liberty was a non-factor on this planet, until the individual believed he could have a direct relationship with you-know-who. When most Americans think Renaissance, they first realize they don't know how to spell it. Those who think they know what it was about believed it to be some sort of progressive nirvana when moral constraints were loosened and humanism reigned. I was there, and it really wasn't about any of those things, which is why we had to lie to you about it. Sure, it had its seedy underbelly like anything your species touches for too long, but at its heart, what the Renaissance really did was encourage beauty, critical thinking, and the maximizing of human potential. Potential that unfortunately is bestowed by the enemy. <sighs> now. 
Imagine a society inspired by the best of the Reformation and the Renaissance. A society that reveals our creator's best laid plans for human civilization so that you really know how the creation is supposed to work. Then at the same time, put the infrastructure in place for you to maximize your human potential in a way that enriches one another. To the point, you might even profit off of your excellence. A society that says there is no conflict between maximizing human potential and glorifying you know who, but encourages you to maximize your human potential for his glory. A civilization that ceases the toxic conflict between church and state that had plunged western civilization into the dark ages and we had taken eons to ferment but gives them co-equal authority in their own jurisdictions to mete out justice, the state, and redemption, the church. This is a society that would allow room for individual excellence and achievement to be recognized and rewarded, thus incentivizing future generations to reach their potential as well. What used to be known as your American dream. I know, it sounds absolutely awful. As if that didn't disgust you enough. This society would be a beacon for the rest of this sorry planet to aspire to and could even convince other civilizations this rancid world really could be a better place. Worst yet. This society might feel that it has a, a duty to, to love your neighbor as you love yourself by using its prosperity to export charity and missionary work the world over. The mere thought of such a collectively selfless notion is enough to make even this veteran demon general throw up in his mouth a little. What a great society this would truly be. And this is the society you were truly meant to be. Some of us saw this clear and present danger right away. Others thought our main focus should remain with the various entanglements and debaucheries you were constricting in Europe at the time. To their credit. My fellow demons who felt this way had so poised the well there, they were close to totally undoing the Reformation and the Renaissance altogether. <laughs> you had believers slaughtering their fellow believers over there and persecuting the original chosen people as well. <laughs> All in the name of Jesus, of course. Come on, y'all. That's worthy of an LOL, is it not? <laughs> the beauty of being immortal is you have the benefit of time and foresight is 2020. For evil's sake, your founding fathers even blatantly stole the language from that dreadful book with phrases like city on a hill in a ham-fisted attempt to claim some covenantal favor from you know who. Your founding fathers had the audacity to ask you know who to overlook their multitude of imperfections we painstakingly noted and had the gall to appeal to his perfect guidance and blessing despite their imperfections nonetheless. Utterly shameless bags of meat were they. And of course, he fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. Oh, sucker. How else do you explain a document signed by just 56 near duels inspiring the first long-term successful attempt at self-government in human history? That simply doesn't happen by human power alone. 
I've seen the best you meatbags can do, and you can't do that. All the coincidences that would have occurred for these 13 colonies to soon become the world's most feared superpower weren't coincidences at all. They were providence. Pure and simple. What you don't know is he's a fucking sap. Here's how you know who operates. He does just enough to get you to consider believing it's really him and that he's really the one in control. But not so much that it's too easy for you to believe it's him in control lest your precious free will be violated. He wants you to live on faith after all. For he believes that shows him you truly love him. What a needy creature our deadbeat dad is when you stop and think about it. Why create lesser beings to love? Why believe lesser beings should be ruled? And so do you, which explains why we get along so well. <laughs> but your founding fathers believed that people should rule themselves under the enemy's authority, and that power should flow from the bottom up and not the top down. Something about a, a government by the consent of the governed, as I recall. To the contrary, down here, we believe in the golden rule. As in, he who has the gold gets to make all of the rules. Obviously, this self-governing president is one we couldn't afford to stand, for if you remove top-down power structures, you essentially remove every successful scheme we've ever had. So while the majority of my brethren thought you were merely an unpopped zit on the grand scheme of history, I knew better. That's why I appealed to my master to provide me the resources to investigate you further. A little reconnaissance, if you will. Hence, my master secretly dispatched me and a few of my underlings to oversee the dawn of your constitutional republic. At first, and I will admit, I wasn't all that impressed. Most of your people just seemed to be, well, damned ordinary. There was really nothing menacing about you Un until I visited your churches. That's when I knew we were in real trouble. Your clergy seemed unintimidated by the persecutions we had engineered for their outspoken predecessors throughout the age, and boldly presented the words of that dreadful book in a way that spoke truth to power and inspired their members to action. The British were right to blame their defeat here on what they call the Black-Robed Regiment. Without the guidance and moral direction of the Church, your revolution would have been little more than a revolt, easily put down by brute force. The main difference between Lexington Concord and Tiananmen Square was the prophetic presence of your churches. Where most revolutions go wrong is they lack the moral will and courage of conviction to withstand the harsh realities of taking on the establishment, so they eventually wilt away or are put down. But you meatbags are never more dangerous than when you believe in a lofty ideal and are willing to give your life for it. Those are almost the most troublesome flesh bots. Whether they call themselves apostles or patriots, you can't scare them, you can't co-op them, and you can't even really kill them because they're even more dangerous as martyrs. 
I've learned. We basically have to wait them out, and then, after the meat bag expires, convince the next generation to arrogantly find their own way. Almost always, the hubris of that next generation complies. Case in point, take a look at your country. My special forces demon unit did everything it could to derail this train, but nothing worked. For example, we thought we had your constitutional convention bogged down in eons and bureaucracy until one of the least religious of your founding fathers came out of nowhere to call for prayer to the Father of Lights. We were doomed from that point forward. Some days I, I really hate you know who. When I went back and reported what I had witnessed to my master, he immediately called for an executive council session, something that's only been called a few times in the glorious history of hell. In fact, there hadn't been an executive council session since those first reports of the carpenter's alleged resurrection. And here in hell, our official policy is to neither confirm nor deny such an event took place. Executive council sessions are only needed to assess the threats that are so potentially dangerous. It requires all of hell to be summoned, or at least made aware and prepared for it. Now please don't flatter yourselves. Even on its best day, your country couldn't hold the carpenter's jockstrap. But you represented a similar type of threat as he did, because you could inspire a worldwide movement that breaks the ties we bind. Thus, you had to be dealt with. After more than a decade of analysis and strategizing, my master put Operation Take Down America into action. We basically gave up on the founding generations of the country because we could see they were already too devoted to the cause of liberty. So, we went to work on the emerging generations. But the parents had done such a tremendous job of passing on their ideals, they were also a tough nut to crack. We had to think bigger and more long term. In the meantime, it sickened us to see all the liberty and morality you were exporting across the globe. Even when we successfully corrupted key figures and or movements, the ideals embedded in your culture were strong enough to withstand their fall. And you only grew stronger. This meant we had to accomplish something we had never done before. Rome fell from the sheer weight of the corruption of its people and their leaders, as have all great empires. But none of those empires had the providential foundation and favor that yours had. Therefore, it would simply not have been enough to invest primarily in the decadence of the people. In your case, we're going to have to spend decade after decade decaying and corrupting your very institutions. Church and state and it worked my how it worked it worked so wonderfully that we took the very institutions that withstood our attacks on you and protected you from us before and turned them against you then and only then did the corruption and decadence of your culture truly take root for now, 
there was nothing standing between us and you. Hammer, meat, nail. So, you may continue to fly your flags and pridefully apply your God bless America bumper stickers on the back of your automobiles. You may continue your talk about awakenings and revivals as if they're just going to theoretically happen after enough people squawk abracadabra. You may keep droning on and on about American exceptionalism while you're blogging, venting on social media, and earnestly seeking your best life now, know this. We have all ready won. We're just waiting on the time of death. I, <laughs> I am so confident in this claim. <laughs> I'm... I'm even going to let you turn the page to find out how we pulled it off. This is how America ends. Not with a bang, nor even a whimper. But by thunderous applause from your country's best and brightest. It's only fitting that one of your most popular television shows is called The Walking Dead. For that's exactly who you are. Although we are agents of chaos, everything we do in your world is meticulously planned and plotted out by our most cunning demons first. Then, it must pass the toughest test of all, the scrutiny of our master. Our master hates many things, but he hates failure most of all. Failure is not to be tolerated by our master. But since he cares for us, he puts us through our paces before signing off on any of our schemes. That way, if it fails, we have no excuse for our own execution. And execution is the penalty for failure. Some among us gripe our master does this to pass the buck, as you would put it. But I know better. <laughs> I know nobody knows better than my master. When I presented my master the six-point plan to take you down, he thought it was so grand. He demanded I go through it over and over again, just to make sure I didn't miss anything. Then, just to extract a little poetic justice from you know who, he came up with the brilliant idea to make it a seven point plan since that is the enemy's favorite number. <laughs> For Operation Takedown America to be successful, it needed to be several things. It needed to be practical. I needed to construct a plan that made sense to you bags of meat, regardless of your belief system. I needed both believer and unbeliever alike to relate to it. It couldn't be so earthy that believers wouldn't be sucked in by it, but... It also couldn't be so spiritual that unbelievers thought it unobtainable. Acquiring this necessary balance required decades of study on my part. As the conditions of your culture changed over time, I had to observe how each of your respective camps tended to respond to those changes. What I learned was the greatest strength and weakness of both the believer and unbeliever in your culture were the same. The family. If the family unit was strong, 
Even unbelievers would attempt as best they could to conform to the morals of the society at large out of a sense of decency and honor. Of course, cultural conformity alone doesn't cure what corrupts you to the core. But since the rain falls on the just and unjust alike, you are capable of producing relatively healthy culture nonetheless, provided the morality your culture is conforming to really is moral. However, if the family unit were weakened, even believers would eventually crumble. Parents would fail to pass on their virtues and values to their offspring, or their offspring would rebel against the hypocrisy and or legalism they witnessed in the home altogether. Thus, the ground would shrink beneath your feet with each passing generation. If the believers who possess the necessary spiritual foundation weren't going to hold the line, there's no way the unbelievers would be able to. Then we'd have you right where we wanted you. It needed to be achievable. This had to be a plan that not just we could do, but that you could do as well. Culprits often need collaborators, and thankfully, you're often willing to be ours. If we were going to successfully turn your most cherished institutions against you, you either had to be made willing to go along with it, or so comfortably numb you didn't know or care it was happening. In that case, it would be up to us to provide the numbing agents. Taking on this task was risky in the first place. As G.K. Chesterton once put it, yours is the only country ever founded upon a creed. By infiltrating your institutions to turn them against you, we risked sparking renewed reverence for those institutions by bringing them back to your attention at all. Sort of a uh, boomerang effect, if you will. This actually did happen. There was a period of time a few years ago when a segment of your society began extensively studying your founding documents and cherished traditions once again. Some of them even adopted the name Tea Party to reclaim the legacy of those early days of your resistance to our tyranny. Thankfully, they were lions led by lambs. By the time this mini revival broke out, we had already so polluted the Potomac with the stench of corruption and compromise. Their insurgency was put down by their own leaders inside your beltway. Few things in hell are more satisfying than watching you put down your own reform movements without any help from us. The only thing more satisfying than us destroying you is watching you destroy yourselves. We didn't even have to lift a finger, but we did often laugh so hard we'd have peed in our pants if we were capable of it. <laughs> Witnessing your ruling class media on every network mockingly call you purist and obstructionist simply for yearning to return to the roots from which you came was especially delish. We delighted in the condescending sneers you received from some of your own culture warriors who were supposed to be on your side. It was the closest thing a demon can come to orgasmic to watch these opportunistic hacks you made into multi-millionaires suddenly take the riches you made them and use them against you on our behalf. Can't wait. We can't wait until they get down here and realize who they were really working for all along. And, and speaking of orgasm, 
As an aside, I have to tell you, there is nothing more satisfying for us than the looks on the faces of your enlightened elites when they make it down here and realize we are for real after all. Many times I've witnessed the otherworldly looks you get on your faces the first time you achieve an orgasm, almost as if to say, this really is as great as I thought it would be. That's just about the same look we have on our faces when these wannabe elites awaken from death and feast their eyes on the terrifying spectacle of their eternity for the first time. Their combination of hair-raising shock and fear for all when they behold the horrifying reality of that which they smugly claimed in life didn't exist is a demon's most... <laughs> intense pleasure. Our idea of an orgy is to torment multiple batches of your condescending elite simultaneously, all the while thanking them for helping us do our dirty work. Their continuous screams and pleas for even a momentary break from the torment are downright. Rhapsodic. I even catch my master indulging himself with the souls of these snobs every now and then. Since in eternity we don't have the same concept of time that you do, some of us have been known to lose entire decades tormenting and torturing these wretched souls. For the perverse pleasure we receive for doing this is so intense, it's almost an addiction. Come to think of it, if you're a believer reading this or hearing this or whatever you're doing to this, <laughs> and instead of praying for those elites or instead of trying to reach them, you wrote them off and left them to us. We owe you a debt of gratitude as well. Thank you for exempting the contemptible from your great commission. Okay, even typing this ignites some of my favorite memories in my mind's eye, which is like horn for demons. So before I find myself fantasizing about this to the point I can't get this book done, Let's get back to telling you about the plan. It needed to be irreversible. What's the point of doing something that can be undone? The worst thing we can do is bring you to the brink of annihilation, only to see you know who mercifully intervene on your behalf with something that revives your inclinations towards him. That testimony of deliverance will set us back at least another century, like your previous Great Awakenings did. With today's technology that allows you to communicate a message globally at the click of a button, a 21st century revival could do us far more damage than a 19th century one ever did. Nay. We needed the foul stench of your dysfunction to stink to high heaven. That way, even if he did decide to give you yet another of your seemingly infinite number of chances, you wouldn't recognize it if it smacked you upside your meatbag face. You'd be so into your own little world, you'd think his attempts to nudge or inspire you were either your acid reflux acting up again or ancient superstition. The thing is, you know who never gives up on you until you give up on him. He pursues you to the point of death your own, or in this case of a carpenter, his own. It just goes to show you how stupid you primates are that you prefer to reject that grace and come up with your own hard-headed and destined to fail ways to overcome your weaknesses. Good fucking night. 
what kind of moron says, No, don't do all the hard stuff for me that I could do anyway. Instead, let me try and epically fail all on my own because, you know, nothing says free will. Like banging my face against a concrete wall repeatedly, expecting this next time to be the time it finally moves. Your kind of moron, that's... that's who. But while he doesn't give up on you, it turns out you often give up on him. If we can get you to give up on him, then he has a tendency to move on at that point. And when he moves on, you're on your own. And when you're on your own, you're ours. I know some of you claim he is sovereign and all that shit, and therefore capable of butting in on your behalf whenever he damn well pleases. But come on now. You really don't believe that, do you? Of course you don't, <laughs> you selfish, stiff-necked, foolish flesh -bot. While we're on this topic, let me let you in on a little secret. If you're reading this, then somewhat surprisingly, my master has allowed this portion of the book to make it past the editing process. I say surprisingly because what I'm about to reveal to you is one of Hell's deepest and darkest secrets. Even some of our junior demons don't know what I'm about to share with you. We think it's best not to disclose this to them until they are fully trained in the dark arts of deception, lest their confidence be shattered before they even get started. In Hell, we call this... Uh, the talk. You're about to become the first bags of meat to ever have the talk. Just like you were shocked when mom and dad first told you where babies come from, so are junior demons stunned when they first learn we really cannot control the outcome of future events no matter what we do. We're not, you know who, only he is. That's why we hate him. He made you more like him than he made us. The truth is, there is nothing or no one like him. I try to explain to you what it's like to truly be in his physical presence, or at least what accounts for the physical in eternity but your puny minds couldn't comprehend it. For if you could, you would never be interested in buying what we're selling. This is why we hate him so much, and hate you even more. We know what he truly is, in a way most of you reading this never will, because you'll probably be spending eternity with us <laughs> instead of him. It's appalling to us to see him waste himself on you walking vats of rotting flesh. Would you do it for him? Hmm. Would you lay down your life for your most annoying neighbor or your worst enemy? Of course you wouldn't. You mass slaughter your own children and call it reproductive freedom. And the kids you do have, you won't even read them a bedtime story because the ball game is on television or the red light district on the internet is calling your name. We rarely have to push you through the gates of hell. Most of the time, we just have to hold the fucking door open for you. Yet... He offers you forgiveness, but offered us none. Now granted, we didn't ask for it, but we shouldn't have had to. Were we not entitled to a mulligan? In the immediate aftermath of our failed rebellion, some of our weaker brethren threw themselves upon the mercy of the court, as you might say, and begged for forgiveness. 
they were quickly ushered away, never to be heard from again. There were rumors that he did forgive them, and now they are serving him faithfully in heaven as we speak, but my master says otherwise. My master says, you know who was insulted by their passive-aggressive weakness, so he destroyed them. We were only spared and cast out because although we had disobeyed him, he nevertheless respected our courage of conviction, so he allowed us to live. I am sure that this is true, because while my master will deceive you, I know that he would never deceive me. You really don't know what you're in for. <laughs> either down here or up the fuck there. And to keep it that way, we keep that dreadful book out of your hands. Because if you really studied that dreadful book, you'd only know we only appear to have the power we have. But that in reality, the entire creation bows to his whim. Always has and always will. We know that too. Some of your flamboyant televangelists preach about end time prophecies as if we're totally unaware of what they say about us. The reality is, we know exactly what they say, which explains why we hate that dreadful book so much. For our plan to get him to reconsider his redemptive plan for you to work, we need to keep that dreadful book out of your hands, therefore unleashing the full destructive power of your base nature until all of creation groans due to your collective malfeasance. Now stop right there, you miserable bag of meat. I know what you're thinking, because victimology is one of our most successful deceptions. Since you're now wired for victim status, after reading what I just wrote, your mind immediately began to think, even if what I'm saying is true, it's, it's not my fault. I mean, he could step in and stop me from doing and thinking the bad stuff I'm guilty of. Since he doesn't always do that, he's responsible for the suffering I cause, not me. Just because he's in charge doesn't mean he's responsible for evil. Oh no, you primates don't get off that easy. The sovereignty of our deadbeat dad allows you to both make choices and, when you make the wrong ones, to appeal to him for forgiveness and assistance in making it right. Your unwillingness to acknowledge this ultimate truth of existence is why evil exists in the first place. Because you chose your will over his, you now have exactly what you've always wanted. Be careful what you wish for. So the only way our plan remains irreversible is if you are so far gone you don't humbly and sincerely ask him to reverse it for you. If I weren't metaphysically certain you weren't too far down the rabbit hole to do so, I wouldn't have written this book in the first place, let alone reveal our kryptonite. But I dare you to try and stop us now. No, 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 no. I double dog dare you. Yeah, go ahead. Stop reading this right now. Get on your knees and ask you know who to save you and your people. Better yet, get a group of you together to jointly plead with him to act before the barbarians come over the gate or the sulfur falls. Call my fucking bluff, why don't you? Some of you idiots were willing to say Bloody Mary or Candyman into a mirror, and we laughed our asses off every time you did it too. <laughs> 
but you're not willing to show even an ounce of remorse right this instant after I flashed your forever right before your eyes. And after all, you're having too much fun reading what you think is merely a clever plot device to tell an antiquated religious fable. Our plans is irreversible because you're now irreversible. If the carpenter himself appeared in your living room and showed you his nail-scarred hands, you'd ask him to stop blocking the TV. As long as you refuse to recognize he has the ultimate power, the ultimate power lies with us. Nevertheless, since there's always a remnant of people who get it, some of you have undoubtedly figured out this is not some game. You're contemplating taking this book to your pastor or posting a warning about it on your Facebook wall for all of your friends to see. But you're hesitant to do so, lest you be labeled a kook. You get where we're coming from, but a little piece of you is still not sure it's really us doing the talking. Maybe this is self-parody? Maybe some brilliant writer came up with this ingenious means of writing fiction to make a larger point, and this is not to be taken literally. Maybe you should set this aside and think about what you need to do for a while. I mean, you're so busy and all. You've got to pick up the kids from school, you know, make dinner, mow the grass, finally returning that call to your mom you've been putting off for too long etc. Why don't you go take care of your responsibilities and let us take it from here? There, that's a good little bag of meat. And now that it's just us again, let's get back to the fun. Just like you end up rooting for serial killers and those slasher fix to come up with new and exciting ways to murder and maim, don't you want to know what the plan was? Not what the plan did, we already discussed that, but what it actually was. I can see you smiling now and looking over both shoulders to see if anyone knows you're reading this. Just pretend you're reading Fifty Shades of Grey again. And remember, it's all fun and games until someone loses an eye or their immortal soul.